Welcome to Unsupervised Thinking, a podcast on neuroscience, artificial intelligence, and science more broadly. We are a group of computational neuroscientists. I'm Grace. I'm Jan. And I'm Josh. And the topic for this episode is learning rules in the brain. Um, and so we read for this uh, mainly two pieces, but kind of skimmed a third one. The first one is called Theories of Error Backpropagation in the Brain by James Whittington and Rafael Bogosh. And that is from Trends in Cognitive Sciences. And technically, that was published on March 1st, 2019, <laughs> which as of this recording has not happened. Um, but that's the magic of academic publishing. Uh, the second piece is a shorter opinion piece that kind of expands on a topic that comes up in the first review. And that's called Dendritic Solutions to the Credit Assignment Problem by Blake Richards and Tim Lillycrap. And that's in Current Opinion in Neurobiology 2018. And then the third piece that we kind of just skimmed and probably won't get into, but um, has a lot of relevant information as well, is called Control of Synaptic Plasticity in Deep Cortical Networks by Peter Rolfsema and Anthony Haltmat. And that's in Nature Reviews Neuroscience 2018. So to kind of break down this topic of learning rules in the brain, I guess we should talk about what a learning rule is. Really what's meant by that is basically in the brain you have neurons that connect to each other, Um, and they connect at a synapse, and so there's kind of properties of the synapse that determine how strong that connection is. And through various processes related to the activity of the neurons that form the synapse, uh, there can be changes there. There can be physical changes that change the strength of the connection between the neurons. And so learning rules in the brain kind of are a way to talk about how the connections between neurons change in the brain and kind of the factors that determine what the connection strength between neurons are. Now, if you have an artificial neural network, you also have neuron-like things. They're just, you know, simple nodes in a network, Uh, but they have weights that connect them. There are values that determine how strongly one artificial neuron impacts another one. And so when you train a neural network, what you do is you change the values of those connection weights. And so there are rules by which you change those values. And so those are learning rules that exist in artificial neural networks. And basically what um, has been known for a bit is that we have learning rules for artificial neural networks that are pretty efficient at making those networks do uh, impressive things like classify images and play games and other stuff like that. But the rules that we use in artificial neural networks don't really correspond to the rules that we see happening in the brain and biological neural networks. And so for the past few years, there have been researchers who have been really focused on trying to reconcile this difference and kind of trying to find ways of uh, making these rules that work in the artificial networks more biologically constrained and kind of searching for them in the brain. So this back and forth between looking for ways of making uh, the artificial rules more biological-like and checking the biology for signs of what we know happens in the artificial rules. So I guess just to clarify, uh, so what what's the context in which in artificial systems uh, you would have learning rules that are not at all biological? I mean, we don't know like two things. We don't know if we're using optimal learning rules already in artificial systems. And we don't know uh, if the brain is anywhere near as optimal. So. Like, I guess the hunch is we're doing something sensible in synthetic systems right now, like in artificial systems. It's something that's, like, possibly better than what's going on in biological systems. Is this... I mean, are they later on, right? Well, but... Uh, so this is, the, this is the point. It's unknown, yeah. right? We don't know, like, what the maximum capacity... Sure, yeah. I mean, yeah. we just can't characterize yet mm-hmm. what the maximum capacity learning rule would be, or, like, the most powerful learning rule would be. Uh, we use certain sets of rules... Um, in synthetic systems, yeah. and I guess the like the rough intuition is the thing we do, which we believe to be pretty good. So backpropagation, which we believe to be pretty good in an artificial system, may not be literally implementable. I mean, it, it presumably isn't literally implemented the way that it's implemented in artificial systems. Mm-hmm. And so then the question is: Is the brain doing something not as powerful as that, or has the brain approximately implemented? 
backpropagation through like a mechanism that's different than the mechanism we use in artificial systems. I think we need to define backpropagation okay. if we're going to get into this. <laughs> so backpropagation is the algorithm by which most of kind of the headline grabbing artificial neural networks that you may have heard of um, have been trained. And it's a way of doing, it's mainly for supervised learning, though technically you use it in things that are considered unsupervised. Um, but the point is just that you um, have a neural network, you have all these artificial neurons that are connected to each other, and uh, you send an input into this network, into the uh, first layer, and then it propagates through the later layers if we're talking about just like a standard feed-forward neural network. Um, and then what you want to do is you want to change the weights between the neurons at different layers, the connection weights that I was talking about before. You want to change those weights in a way that will make the network perform better on whatever task that it's doing. So in the standard case of a neural network where you put in an image and you want it to output an object label, so say what's in the image, you at the end of the network, at the final layer of the network, you have a way of putting into the network what the correct answer is. And then what you do is you take the difference between what the network originally guessed by doing this feed forward pass through all of its layers, you take the difference between its guess and the true answer, and you take that information and you send it back all the way through the network and you change all the weights such that the next time it's shown that image, it will be closer to outputting the true answer. And the way that you actually do this is through calculus. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. through what's called the chain rule, uh, which just says that if you want to know how the, uh, the error changes as a function of a given weight in the network, which is what you want to know because you want to change the weight so that it makes the error less, um, you can calculate that if you know all the intervening steps. So if you know how the error changes with respect to the, the neurons in the last layer, their activity, and then you know how the activity of those neurons changes with respect to the weights that go into them and the neural activity of the layer before them. And then you can just go all the way back through using what's called the chain rule to calculate how to change the weights at one point uh, in the network to make the error less. That was pretty satisfying for a description with, uh, with no explicit mathematical equation <laughs> stated. Yeah. So the reason that backpropagation doesn't seem to be plausible as a method for how the brain is updating weights is just because in order to update a single weight between um, one neuron and another, you need to know in total information that happens kind of very far from those two neurons. So you need to know uh, basically what the error is that may have been calculated in some brain area far away, and then you have to send that error signal um, back through multiple brain areas and get it to uh, the, the neurons that you're trying to update. And what we believe about biological learning rules is that they act very locally, meaning that the information that you use to update the weights between two real neurons depends um, on the activity of those neurons usually. And so you have to find a way to get this information that's calculated later about the error back to these neurons in a form that they can use uh, to update their weights. So maybe we should talk about um, biological learning rules for comparison's sake. So does anyone want to explain like heavy learning, STDP, something like that? Yeah, sure. Um, so, so the thing about biological learning rules is they all generally, all of them are local um, or have some sort of global neuromodulatory um, sort of signal. Um, so the, the standard one is Hebbian, which is just uh, the weight update is pre, the presynaptic um, activation by the postsynaptic activation as the simplest form. Neurons that fire together, wire together is what's often said. So if they're correlated, then they strengthen. And then there's anti-Hebbian, which is uh, they get weaker if they're if they're correlated. Uh, I guess uh, it's been shown that you can have this also in a spike timing dependent way, where you have in, instead of thinking of neurons as sort of this continuous rate function, if you think of them as uh, having spiking at a certain time, then if they spike close together, then they if once if there's a pre then a post spike, then that tends to strengthen the synapse as well. And then three, I guess three factor rules is the other one, which is what I talked about with. Um, kind of this sort of global signal that happens where you might have two neurons that are correlated in their pre post activations. And then the question is, okay, you know, we know that they are one neuron A is having an influence in neural neuron B, but what do we do with that information? 
and that information then can be used. If there is like a reward at a later stage, for example, there might be this uh, neuromodulatory signal that then says, okay, you can strengthen or you can depress based on, based on that. And that's the third factor, basically. Yeah, and we talked about that in our reinforcement learning episode. In the case of reinforcement learning, dopamine acts as the third factor. So yeah, so we have these two types. We have the algorithm that people use for artificial neural networks, and we have kind of a slew of things that we know about for biological learning rules and different principles show up in different brain areas or under different circumstances. And yeah, the goal is to like put them together, which I mean, in some way, it's just like such a beautiful problem, just like in its clarity. <laughs> like, I feel like this rarely happens in computational neuroscience or maybe any kind of science that's just like, okay, here's what we want to get done. Here's like a bag of things that we know the brain has. And a lot of them we don't know the mm-hmm. purpose of. So there's also like, like the exact ways in which the synapse changes or things that can happen inside the cell that exist on longer time scales with protein development. Or there's just a lot of things that we know change in the brain when activities change. And people speculate about what the role of all these different methods of biological plasticity, like what their purpose is in a computational sense. And now we have this clear computational goal and all these puzzle pieces of the biology that people want to fit together to try to explain how you could get the computational goal achieved. So, yeah, I mean, I guess I'm going back to my point from earlier, um, I, I guess... Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm still not totally clear, but I guess the, the working assumption is that, like, in artificial systems, we kind of have a reasonable idea of what, like, a right solution is. And it certainly works relatively well. And if we tried to take, like, the simplest notions of what biological learning rules are and implement them in artificial systems, they're local but don't quite work as efficiently as the ones that uh, are commonly employed for contemporary artificial systems. I would say they don't work kind of at all on any truly challenging problems. Mm -hmm. If you try to just like apply heavy and learning to image classification, you won't do very well. Yeah, basically, in in, in the simplest form, what we believe to be true about the biological uh, learning rules, if we took them naively and applied them in an artificial system, they like wouldn't work very well as engineering solutions. Sure. So the the, the point of this of this way of uh, of doing science, this 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 particular problem space is like we think maybe we're ahead on the artificial system learning side and we're trying to leverage that insight to figure out how the brain must be doing it on the grounds that it's probably not doing something so poor like compared to what we currently use for artificial systems is that the assumption um i would i would sort of push back a little bit on that and say like we have we think that we have a way of doing it that works well in artificial systems uh there are there are probably, I would say very likely, many other ways of doing it in artificial systems. Uh, we could actually be, I think if we follow your view very strictly, we could actually sort of get ourselves into a bit of a, ro- or a one-way street in neuroscience where, where we get obsessed with making sure that everything fits to like biological, biologically possible back prot specifically as opposed to um, learning in general maybe. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I also don't disagree with you. I'm not, I'm not actually trying to say that I think that that would be the right... Sure. But I'm, yeah, like, yeah. Under this framework, it's good like, to have this sort of to and fro between uh, neuroscience and machine learning. Yeah. No. And, and I'm, I guess I, I'm trying to understand fully the motivation for even claiming that there is a biological implementation of backprop yeah, at all. Yeah. Right. Like this subfield's perspective is that the brain is probably doing something more powerful than like what contemporary neuroscientists yeah, and yeah. biologists think it's doing, because the thing that they think it's doing is probably too weak when you try to use it as an algorithm on artificial systems. So it's almost like this uh, this test. It's like, if neuroscientists propose the brain is learning by this scheme, but then you try to use that to solve a real problem and it doesn't work, Yeah, the neuroscientists are probably wrong and need to update their thinking. Yeah, I well, I think it it's not at all guaranteed that the brain is using something that's very close to backpropagation. So the people who are looking for that while it's a very reasonable thing to do, I think, given that it's a thing that we know works in things that are brain-like in that they're artificial neural networks. Uh, yeah, it's reasonable to try, but they're, they're not guaranteed at all to find it. Yeah, I think this is kind of what I was trying to get at, right? It's like, it, 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 it isn't clear to me that we should take it for granted that there even is a biological yeah. implementation yeah, of yeah, yeah, yeah. But maybe the people who are trying to make a case for it kind of implicitly believe 
or explicitly believe, the brain must be doing something better than what contemporary neuroscientists think it's doing. Yeah, I feel like that is um, empirically true because what contemporary neuroscientists know about learning rules can't give you the abilities of the brain. But whether there's, you know, a whole space of learning rules that aren't like backprop and are still better than what we know currently, I mean, that's totally possible. But, I mean, in some weird abstract sense, you could just, like, take anything that you find that's happening in the brain and kind of claim it's backprop in some way if it yeah. reduces the error, <laughs> you know? Um, so we can kind of get more into the specifics of this uh, review paper that we read. So, yeah, the, the reasons that they give for backprop not being possible or unlikely in the brain in its current form are this lack of the local error representation, the fact that calculating how to change a weight between neurons requires the, as they say, activity and computations of all downstream neurons. That was one reason. They also talk about the symmetric feed-forward and feedback uh, connections, which mm -hmm. we can get into. I'm not convinced that it's that big an issue myself. I don't know. So this idea is that in order to send the error signal back, um, you need to have connections that are the same. They're like the inverse of the, the, the way the information was sent forward. And so that would mean that, you know, between different brain areas, there's connections that go forward and then there are perfectly matched connections that go backwards and like that doesn't happen. Um, so that's, that's the, the problem with this. This is a subset of the problem that you need to get the error yeah. It looks so it's like the, the first thing that they say that's not plausible. This is kind of a subset of that problem. This is like how it's solved, but the solution isn't possible either. The solution employed in artificial systems for sending error backwards is to have these sort of symmetric weights. And so if you believe that like a literal implementation of backpropagation were to exist in the brain, it would require symmetric weights. That's like obviously not true. So first pass, there's definitely not like an exact implementation of backpropagation the way it's kind of implemented in artificial systems. But you could have sort of indirect connections that approximate this or some other sort of relaxation of back of, of the sort of little yeah. backpropagation algorithm that's implemented. Yeah. And like, I mean, I guess they, they, they talk about this paper from Tim Lillycraft and others where it basically r random feedback can do quite well if, if it's then aligned, I think. Is that how it works? Yeah, it's like if you build a network that's kind of whatever, a normal feed-forward network, and instead of using symmetric weights to send the error back, you just use random yeah. numbers to calculate the error, which seems like it shouldn't work. Kind of through the learning process, the feed-forward weights start to kind of look a bit yeah, like yeah. the inverse of the feedback ones. So they're yeah. kind of aligning themselves with the feedback, and so it ends up working okay in the end. But Yeah, I think that it's probably stated a bit strongly in here that like, these specific connections, feedback connections, aren't aren't seen in the brain or aren't possible. I mean, obviously, identical uh, symmetric ones aren't possible because you need that you know it needs to be replicated or whatever. But I think there are de there's definitely specific feed forward um, or feedback, sorry, you know, uh, connections to neurons that are tuned to a certain area in V1 and they get tuned input, tuned feedback input as well. And I think this is kind of maybe not fully. I mean, it's only beginning to get realized, but it's, I think I would expect a lot more of, of these findings in the next five years or so anyway. So. Yeah, for sure. Like the, the notion of feedback connections in the brain, that's fine. That happens. And yeah, they're targeted in some ways that we don't really understand right now because there's not a lot of good data about um, what connects to what in terms of sending connections from a higher area in the brain to a lower one. Yeah, the, the notion of the feedback connections is fine. It's just the the idea that they have to be symmetric is what's not acceptable. <laughs> um, but related to the kind of the existence of a specific feedback, because um, they talk about one possibility to get around, you know, the need for error signals to be local is kind of what you were talking about, about the third factor learning. Like you have a neuromodulatory signal that tells you an error. And so that would mean that like there's some neurotransmitter that's kind of diffusely released um, during the learning process. But the problem with that is that it's not specific. It would go kind of equally or randomly to all neurons, regardless of the information that they're carrying, and it would impact their weights kind of not in a specific enough way to facilitate learning. So the, the fact that feedback connections can be specific and targeted makes them a better possibility for um, this kind of learning where you need sure. specific information. 
Although, I mean, it's not clear that, I, mean, I think it isn't the case that neuromodulators are necessarily totally diffuse, right? I mean, yeah, no, you can go you quite know, target constrained. release of yeah, neuromodulators. Yeah. Sure. And then the third thing that they point to as a difficulty for backprop is that it uses unrealistic neuron models. So in the most basic case, um, what a neuron in an artificial neural network is, is just it takes in some inputs, it adds them up, and it rectifies them. So it makes them positive um, or sets them to zero if they're negative, if the sum was negative. And so that's just like the simplest way you could model a neuron when in reality, I mean, in reality, neurons have spikes. They're not just, this would be kind of like modeling the firing rate of a neuron using this kind of summed equation. Um, but they have spikes and they have all their kinds of complexities and nonlinearities. And if you include those, when you do backpropagation, it complicates the procedure because part of what you do in backpropagation, as I said, when you apply the chain rule, is kind of you're taking derivatives through the network. And if you have a really complicated function, then the derivatives get complicated. They might not be doable analytically. So there are certain types of networks that you kind of can't train with backpropagation if you can't take a derivative. Um, so yeah, so the, the natural complexity of neurons doesn't lend itself to backpropagation in the literal mathematical sense. And so the rest of this paper mostly goes through these four different ways of trying to make backprop more biologically doable. So basically there's two classes. One is temporal error models, and uh, these are models that don't explicitly calculate the error. Um, so we were talking about how you, you need to get the error to the, the weights that are changing, but that doesn't mean you have to have like a neuron that encodes the error. So this first class doesn't encode the error explicitly in any neuron, and then the second class are explicit error models, meaning that they do uh, calculate and encode the error directly. So I mean, I guess the, the rough intuition for the temporal ones is that at one time the unit reflects one value and then at another time it reflects another value. And so it assumes that the system, like the whole system, can set a neuron's value alternatively with some phase yeah. to either like the value it should be if it's listening to its inputs versus a target value which has to be sent backwards yeah. via feedback. Mm -hmm. And if that's possible, then, then it yeah. hypothetically locally has this error signal. Yeah, so this is referred to as contrastive learning. Um, and yeah, it basically means you give the network an input, and at the time that it's solely input driven, like it's just responding however it responds to an input, it's supposed to do anti Hebbian learning so that it's kind of suppressing um, connections that are like where the neurons are coactive. It's suppressing those to kind of like clear out the network. And then you give the um, target, so you kind of tell the last layer of the network how its activity is supposed to be, and that information um, is sent back through the network through feedback connections. And we should say that all of these models talked about in this paper still do assume the symmetric feedback, so we're just kind of glossing over that issue. Um, so yeah, the network is told how it's supposed to be, and in the period where it has the information about how it's supposed to be, in that period it does heavy in learning. So it's kind of, it needs to do opposite learning uh, depending on what what situation it's in. So it definitely needs a signal that's going to, to indicate what situation it's in. If it's in just the feed forward driven or if it's in the feedback kind of uh, correct answer driven time. Yeah. So they, these methods require what these authors refer to as a control signal. Yeah. Which tells you when the neurons represent the one thing and then the other thing. And obviously the question is how how is there a control system in the brain that actually kind of regulates that and so the authors here uh, point to sort of oscillations in the brain as a potential I guess get out clause of some way they can depending on the phase of the oscillation you can be more feed forward driven or feedback driven and that puts you in the in the predictive phase or the learning phase the the version with different phases that's one approach and then they also talk about this other approach where it's a continuous update so mm -hmm. rather than being just feed forward and then given the the feedback signal as well you uh, move the the network slowly between its activity when it's just feed forward driven towards the activity that it's that's the correct activity the activity that comes from having the feedback and then the neurons can use information about the rate of change of their activity as a proxy for how wrong they were sort of how much that neuron has to change its activity to go from the current value 
to the target value reflects the magnitude of the difference between the current value and the target value, which is the error. Yeah. Like if moving to the the correct activity changes the rate very quickly, it's because it was very wrong. Um, and so that information goes into the learning rule for how to update the weights. Now, the issue with that is that typical versions of heavy and learning or spike uh, timing dependent plasticity aren't usually based on the rate of change of a neuron's activity. They're just based on the actual activity. Um, but they claim that there's a way to use normal spike timing dependent plasticity to do this altered version, which I didn't quite understand. <laughs> I think it was just like when you have a lot of spikes happening, when there's more spikes happening, it's less clear what is pre and what is post because everything's going on all in the same time window. Um, and so when you change the rate of spikes, you can actually change whether there's um, depression or facilitation. But I'd say, I mean, you could easily just do it um, using some sort of chemical computation in the neuron as well. That's not necessary, you know, to do with the um, rate or spike timing, um, which isn't really talked about much, I think, in this sort of conversation, really. But yeah. Yeah. See, this is what I'm talking about. There's yeah. all these biological bits and bobs that we have, like, hanging around. Like, we know that there's maybe longer time scale chemical changes mm -hmm. that implicitly track the, the derivative of the neuron's activity. Um, so yeah. You and then when we that. talk about things like weight, I mean, what is a synaptic weight in, in the brain? Is it the, you know, is it the amount of vesicles? Is it the concentration of amp receptors? Um, I think there's a lot of stuff you can play around with that isn't currently played around with that much. It's mostly focused on sort of using X, Y, pre, post, and then sort of maybe some sort of error signal, which it makes sense that they're starting with that. But I think there's, there's a lot of... Yeah, there's... Potentially too many parameters. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like guaranteed that you can cobble together backprop some way through all of these different mechanisms, I assume. <laughs> but yeah. whether the brain's actually using them that way. So yeah, this need for this global control signal is one of the major downfalls of this approach. Um, and so the so that was the first two types of models that this review talks about, the different types of contrastive learning. And then the second group are predictive coding models, which don't require a global control signal to say kind of which phase you're in. Um, and so we uh, talked about predictive coding in our episode on it, but it's normally thought of as an unsupervised learning um, mechanism. Um, so you're just kind of trying to predict things based on um, what you've seen in the past and not based on specific top-down labels. So in this case, they use the same principles of a predictive coding architecture, but to implement supervised learning. So it's a little bit different. But approximately the idea in the predictive coding case is that there is explicitly neurons which represent the error between the current value and the target value, essentially. So whereas before the same neuron had to have a control signal that said like at this phase it's in the current value state and in another phase it's in the target value and we have to look at that difference over time to compute this error. In the predictive coding versions, uh, essentially what you're trying to do is say, well, there's this current value and this is target value and I want to minimize these. Um, and I'm going to do this by leveraging the fact that there's a separate neuron which actually computes the error between the current and the target value and then training can ensue based on that unit's activity, that error unit's activity, as the learning signal. Um, so roughly that's the governing principle of those, which involves explicitly these extra set of neurons. So like every neuron has a paired neuron, which represents its error signals, basically. Yeah, and in the architecture that they draw, you have an error neuron that gets feed forward input from neurons in the layer below that represent the value of whatever this neural network is doing. If it's like encoding some pattern in an image, you'd have a value that represents the existence of that pattern and a neuron that encodes that. And so that sends feed forward inhibitory input into an error neuron at the next layer. And at that same layer, um, there's another value neuron and it, uh, the error neuron gets positive input from the other value neuron. So you have this feed forward uh, input that's inhibitory and this recurrent horizontal input that's excitatory. And so this error unit is doing a subtraction between the two. It's comparing what's coming feed forward with what has come from feedback into this uh, value neuron that exists at the same layer. And so that's how it calculates an error between 
uh, what was expected and what's actually seen, which is in line with the general principle of predictive coding. Um, and in this case, it would be a, an error between what is uh, given as the correct label and what is seen. And this is also what sort of gives it, I guess, its least biological um, property, which is the specific connections between the error units and the and the value units. Right? Or, and even just the existence of these... Air units of the air units. Well, I think that's. I mean, I know. So yeah, I, I'm. I, this is what I'm kind of going to yeah, respond as well. Right. It's like it's not clear that this isn't biological. Yeah. Right? And, yeah. and it's made more biological. I mean, we might as well just get into the the fourth one, sure. which is essentially uh, this. I mean, it's the same, but it's saying that there's a specific architectural implementation for it, which involves dendrites. Yeah. Uh, like apical dendrites. But even aside from you know error being in the dendrites, which we'll talk about, there's also, I think, is evidence for neurons in you know early sensor areas that seem to encode some sort of error or um you know. i think this sounds almost more far-fetched than it is until you actually if you if there's certain biological details that people don't fully understand that are kind of potentially reconcilable with this area yeah, thing. yeah. so there's within the cortex there are different layers of the cortex mm -hmm. and uh uh essentially there are what some people believe to be a sort of canonical cortical microcircuit that functions the same way in all of the areas of the cortex and involves different neurons essentially wired to one another in a fairly stereotyped way. Yeah. And it is plausible that this architecture could be explained as having paired sets of neurons yeah. that represent current value and error signals based on feedback from other areas. So whether you're going to choose to believe that the, the sort of canonical cortical microcircuit uh, could implement this architecture, or similarly, uh, that distal dendrites of some of the neurons in cortex represent essentially the error computation um, or the, the error-based feedback. Uh, either of these hypotheses are not totally implausible. They're, they're, they're relatively yeah. plausible yeah. Um, based on the stereotypy across the cortex in the kinds of wirings and relationships between neurons that we see with the cortical layers. Uh, okay, so yeah, so we're, there's two issues we were talking about. So one is, I think, what Jan was saying about act, you actually see error encoded in neural activity, which you would see if this is true and there are separate neurons that are error neurons. And two is the realism of having these specific connections where you have a neuron that has its little buddy error neuron that, you know, is in lockstep with it. I feel like the existence of cortical microcircuits still, they're not defined specifically enough that they would support this level of um, like individual pairs of neurons if it's meant to be taken in an individual neuron way that still feels a little um, a little loose to me just given, you know, the, the microcircuitry isn't that defined, yeah. it isn't that stereotyped. Um, and then the question of do you actually see errors encoded in neural activity, that has been... Um, People do claim to see it, and in particular, there's things like, you know, surprise responses where mm -hmm. when something doesn't occur that's expected, a neuron fires very strongly. Um, and those those things do happen, but I think the issue there is that those surprise-type signals happen in the same neurons that normally would be thought of as the value neurons here, the neurons that encode the feed-forward information are also sometimes showing surprise signals. Okay. So it doesn't look like it's a segregated set of neurons that do the error versus the value. So actually, the another thing as well, which could be uh, another uh, another possibility is the error and sort of the budding, budding up happening, not at this neuron level, but at the uh, columnar level or something, right? Which I guess wasn't, I'm not sure if it was talked about much, but the future selectivity map of, of cortex in in larger mammals tends to be quite organized anyway. Um, I don't, I just you know, thought about it while reading it, so I don't know whether this, whether there's something really obvious that discounts, you know, having within a certain column uh, error neurons and value neurons, but yeah. Yeah, I don't know, but <laughs> at least that, yeah, having this play out on some sort of broader um, spatial scale that doesn't require such fine tuning between individual neurons does seem more realistic. Yeah, I mean, this is more consistent with the, the cortical microcircuit view. I mean, I, I, yeah, I think what is currently believed, there isn't enough regularity that there would literally, I mean, it might be the case, but at present does not necessarily seem that there's enough regularity for it to literally be the case that literally two neurons are paired, one being the sort of value one and one being the sort of error one. But 
so does this happen at cerebellum though um are they paired in that very precise way or is it also because i know that it cerebellum is talked about as like the sort of uh example of a circuit which seems to be very very set up for this kind of error feedback so um i do feel like they have very specific inputs yeah. in a way that you wouldn't expect to see generally in yeah, cortex yeah. Regardless of the, the the cerebellum connection, which which no no I mean may, maybe like a legitimate model for this yeah, as yeah. is indicated in the second paper uh, that we we make we make it to they they view this sort of uh, cerebellar structure as an analogy to the cortical microcircuit so I mean we're already kind of talking about this 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 connection but um yeah I the, the, I think Jan's point from before that uh, basically even if there are not there might be but even if there are not two paired neurons one that's literally a current value one and one that is an error uh, unit if you have a, a sort of spatial correlation in activation which is thought to be relatively common just neighboring neurons in cortex seem uh, to, to be more similar than the, you would expect by chance right there's some spatial correlation of neighboring neurons kind of being to some extent slightly redundant or coding similar things or representing or doing similar things um, you, you might expect the, the the sort of different the distinction between this current value or uh, and error unit could yeah. be at the level of this local spatial correlation scale yeah right and so I, the the other solution to this fine scale connectivity problem which we will talk about in a moment is that um, it's not two separate neurons it actually happens within a single neuron due to the um, way in which dendrites can kind of have their own thing going on and do their own computations. And so we'll talk about that in a moment, but I just want to make sure that we explained kind of why this one doesn't need a global signal um, telling it what state it's in. So it's just that when you put an input to this network, if you put an input without um, uh, the feedback telling it the, the correct state, uh, then the error units will go to zero just because they have nothing to compare to. And so whatever activity the, ner uh, the network produces is fine and um, it's not in conflict with anything coming from top down. Um, when you put in the target, then the error units in this network via their like feed forward and feedback interactions evolve over time and they um, reach uh, an equilibrium point where they have a non-zero value then you apply a Hebbian learning rule based on the activity of those neurons and the activity of the neurons that encode uh, the value um, in the layer before. And so um, basically, in the case where you don't have a top-down signal, you don't need a global signal to tell you not to learn because the error is zero then. And so even if you applied the Hebbian learning rule, um, it wouldn't cause an update because it requires the activity of the error unit to cause an update. So there's the the switching between states of learning when you have feedback and not learning when you're just feed forward that's just implicit because the error unit goes to zero when you're in a just feed forward state uh, and this is what's meant by the special connectivity right i mean it requires fairly specific connectivity between these error units and the current value units uh and and, and all of the feedback to work out such that you get these error units that perfectly correspond to the error between the, the feed forward and feedback uh, values and then for that error unit to be wired up such that learning follows the exact proper update rule in light of the activity of that unit but then if you just have them all in the same neuron you don't need to wire up specifically at all which is I guess what we're going to talk about now yes yeah. we're going to talk about apical dendrites uh, and so apical dendrites are dendrites that come out of pyramidal cells in the cortex. And so the way a pyramidal cell works, and I'm basing this off of the many um, very simplified graphics I've seen and not any actual knowledge of biology. <laughs> Basically, they are triangles that exist um, <laughs> in uh, the, the layers of the cortex that are deeper down usually. Um, and so the, the neuron in a deeper layer in cortex, it'll have dendrites that exist within that layer, and those are called basal dendrites, or kind of just locally around that layer that it's in and near where the, the cell body is, this um, triangular pyramidal cell body. Um, but then it'll also have a dendrite that it uh, shoots out of the top of it that goes up into the more superficial layers uh, at the, the top of the cortex. 
And so uh, these dendrites are all, you know, getting input for the cell, but they're getting different types of input because the basal dendrites are getting input that is from local recurrent circuits in that layer and also from feed forward input from other brain areas. And the, um, the apical dendrite is getting input that is more modulatory in nature and comes from higher order brain areas or higher order thalamic areas, cortex orthalamical. Um, I implied that the thalamus wasn't part of the brain. <laughs> um, so it gets these more modulatory inputs that go to the apical dendrite. So two different types of inputs to two different types of dendrites. And that allows for the possibility of doing separate computations. And when Grace is talking about layers there, she was talking about the brain layers, superficial and deep being, you know, how deep you go into the brain from layer one to five and not neural network layers from shallow to deep, which is very confusing. It's a horrible, horrible yeah. fact that that word is used so differently, yet in so many of the same contexts. Yeah. Yes. Layers in artificial neural networks correspond more to brain areas, uh, and they don't correspond to layers in the cortex. And it's awful. <laughs> but right, so the idea is that you have this little apical dendrite collecting all of this information up top, and... Um, via the the magic of dendrites kind of it can potentially do its own computations with it i mean i guess the traditional view of dendritic computation usually talks about like you know spatio-temporal pattern matching or something right um but this is so you have like certain activations of spines in a in a certain sequence can lead to a spike whereas if you reverse it then that doesn't happen and also you know the fact that dendrites have branches mean that you can have branch specific computations that make it essentially a neural network in itself but where this sort of theory takes advantage of just the fact that it can be a electrically separate unit basically yeah so basically the distance between the the, the main cell body and the basal dendrites versus the apical dendrites is sufficiently large in in neuron scale terms yeah that any any sort of presynaptic activity that activates the apical dendrites won't immediately affect the activity of the cell body. Uh, so most of the, the, that neuron, basically the, the neuron that we're talking about could have like essentially two segregated compartments. One that is set to the current value and a separate compartment of the same neuron that is set to the error signal. So I, I'm roughly the idea like the, at a conceptual level that for how this is implementing the right thing is that there's like two parts to the same cell. One neuron actually has simultaneously its own current value and error signal in the same cell. Um, and it can use some possibly internal mechanism or some communication mechanism between those two parts. The, the apical dendrite uh, region could send electrical activity to yeah. the rest of the cell, or it could send chemical signals such mm -hmm. as in internal ion concentrations or Calcium, spikes. calcium, yeah, or or, or some, some other kinds of messaging, yeah, um, like mRNA or something like this. Yeah, um, it basically could signal to the to the main part of the cell what the error signal is relative to the current value, and so there are essentially a very large number of schemes whereby having one cell with these two compartments uh, could approximate or implement mm -hmm. the, this kind of computation, this kind of backpropagation like computation. And it's interesting because in a way, you know, we talked about how the very simple neurons that people normally use in artificial neural networks um, are one of the reasons why, you know, backprop um, in the brain might not work because the real neurons are more complicated. But this is a way where adding complexity to the neuron, uh, the, the neural model and how you think about how the neuron works actually aids in making the backpropagation more plausible. Like adding this compartment helps to... Uh, to, to give the neuron a place where it can compute an error. But yeah, so I guess the, the general idea as they laid it out in this paper was that you have these apical dendrites that are getting top-down um, feedback that contain predictions in some way, or um, like the, the supervised learning signal, the, the information about what the correct answer was. And then I believe the point was that 
they can, they take that input and compare it to the activity of the neuron itself. So even though these apical dendrites are far away, they can still have some information about how much the, the neuron is spiking at the cell body. And so they know how active they are and they get top down input about how active they should be and can do that subtraction there. Um, and then these apical dendrites, via the, the magic of dendritic nonlinearities, can create bursting mm -hmm. in the, the cell body. So this is a particular way of spiking um, that apical dendrites are able to initiate, um, where they set up to like 100 spikes per second they could uh, induce. And this would then open up the, the basal dendrites and the soma to um, being plastic. You know, changing the voltage there to induce neuroplasticity via the rules that we've already talked about. Um, so yeah, so this the the version that I just talked about, I feel like is most represented in the second paper we read by um, Richards and Lily Crap. In the first paper, they they talk about this use of apical dendrites, but then they also employ the local inhibitory circuit uh, in the the area of the cell body to aid in some computation and comparison. Um, that I, I don't know if it's necessary, but it certainly seemed to reduce the biological plausibility because it was, again, introducing these like very specific connections, both locally and top down, that would need to happen um, for that error calculation to happen. Whereas in the second paper, it seems to assume that the dendrites themselves can do the error calculation. I think what's nice about the sort of dendritic one as well is like, like you mentioned, the there is strong evidence for plasticity being modulated heavily by the presence of these sort of apical dendritic sort of spike bursts, right? I guess, I mean, the inhibitory circuits are still very much like, very much unknown, so. Uh, there are these cells called Martinati cells that um, have the, con the connectivity that the first paper's scheme kind of requires, um, so that kind of supports that possibility. Uh, they get excitatory input from the pyramidal cell and then they send inhibitory input to the apical dendrite of that same cell um, and that was something that was needed in their scheme of how the uh, error is calculated it's interesting though it does seem like another part of this toolbox is looking for cell types that are kind of predefined and assigning a particular function to them mm -hmm. which in some way is reasonable but then at the same time these cell types are kind of like like the way we define cell types is very complicated and has yeah. a lot to do with genetic markers and things that don't, to me, necessarily mean that they, they, they will have a clear um, function that you can kind of carve out. But it's kind of the, the way that we talk about cells is through these this hodgepodge of cell types that is kind of, you know, defined in so many different ways. Um, so in the second paper, they refer to it as, as a three-factor learning, and that violated my pre-existing notions of what three-factor learning rules are. In what sense? How did they, ref what's their third factor? Well, that, that's my point. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, is it the feedback? Is it the... I believe that the three factors are the feed-forward input, the activity of the cell at the soma, and the feedback input yeah. that comes into the apolodendrite. Because right. the, the apolodendrite, as I understand the scheme, is that you subtract the cell's activity from the feedback or you do some difference there and then you combine that outcome with the feed forward input yeah. that's the learning rule um but it's just i'm used to three factor learning referring to like three separate things that occur simultaneously like with pre and post activity and a neuromodulator yeah i mean they were, i think they were trying in this second paper to make a more explicit analogy to the cerebellar circuit yeah. which we were yeah. kind of talking about before and uh, and in the cerebellar circuit, there is an activity-dependent third factor, which are these complex spikes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so and that involves three different cell types. Um, so yeah, I guess that's not the same as like neuromodulatory factors necessarily in the cerebellum. It is yeah. different. It's like three different cells, and the third type introduces a complex spike that allows the learning to happen between the first two. Um, so I guess the, the treating of the dendrite as its own separate thing is kind of like having three different cell types or something. Mm -hmm. So what models do we like best? Hmm, good question. Well, I'm pretty biased, I think. What is your bias? My bias is towards the, the last one, I think. I mean, my bias is definitely towards the, the explicit error um, 
approach, um, which are the, the last two that we talked about. Um, so, so why is it a bias, not a conclusion? Oh, I see. It's a bias <laughs> because I, I guess it's a bias because I I didn't do that, but I was in a lab that sort of looked at sort of dendritic computation and sort of this kind of stuff. So that that, that I presume that I'm slightly biased in that way. Um, yeah. Whereas, for example, people who have come from backgrounds in which they were studying, for example, oscillations, yeah, would yeah. maybe be more inclined towards like the, the temporal. Yeah, but my so my but I think I I think there are issues with the temporal things which seem, um, they seem to sort of take to to move the problem elsewhere, which is like this control like is like where in the brain is there going to be a control system that knows when to turn? Yeah, yeah I mean I think on. the idea would be if there were general oscillators. Yeah, I mean, well, yeah, I think. I think they, they hint at this in the review. I think the idea is that, yeah, there's just some general oscillator which causes it to be the case both that you only do anti heavy and learning and the feedback is cut off. Like it's controlling both yeah, things at yeah, the same yeah, yeah. time. So that's, you know, setting the clock, synchronizing the yeah. necessary processes. So there's the timing issue, but then there's also the, okay, this is a much bigger question, I guess. It's like, you know, the, the reward coming, you know, how, how do you compute the reward for specific tasks? But I think this is another issue, which is maybe just something that I, uh, you know, I'm not convinced with yet. But yeah, my my personal inclinations uh -huh. also lean towards the what do they call it? What's the second class? The uh, the the explicit error. I think. Does, yeah. Do they call it explicit? Yeah, explicit, the explicit error, ones. error, but also mostly just predictive coding. Well, no, actually, I should say that the second yeah. paper doesn't really talk about predictive, predictive coding. coding. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it makes it seem like yeah you. The, the notion of just something having the error, I guess, is a style of predictive coding you can, you know, the, the yeah, the boundaries bit, aren't clear, I guess. Yeah, they're not, yeah, they're not clear. I mean, I, I'm, I'm inclined both to think that the error is represented uh, explicitly yeah, and that it probably is part of some sort of canonical circuitry. So I, either a cortical microcircuit or the, the structure of the, there being a sort of basal set of dendrites near the cell body and an apicodendrite that's quite distant mm -hmm. is part of the, can the, the canonical cortical microcircuit. So, I mean, I view this as being a likely way of implementing this yeah. kind of, you know, sharing of signals across brain regions yeah. that segregates feed-forward and feedback connections yeah. and a plausible way of generating errors or discrepancies between feed-forward and feedback connections. So, I mean, this seems to fall out pretty naturally of our understanding um, of the way the cortical microcircuit works. And insofar as the cerebellar circuit is a fairly well-characterized circuit, it, it I think the analogy provided in the second paper between these circuits yeah. is a nice one. Um, it at least helps clarify it. I think this is something that has been proposed before, as far as I'm aware. I mean, they're laying out this as a review point, but I've, I've heard this argument uh, made at least verbally to me by yeah. professors in grad school and things like this. Yeah, I feel like when I was reading the first review, I mean, I, I like the apical dendrite story, and that's the, the thing that they end on in the first review. That's their fourth model. Um, and I like it. I, I like apical dendrites. I want them to have a purpose. I like this conceptually. It's aesthetically pleasing and all of that. But then in, in the first review, they have this table where they put like the properties of all of their yeah. different models, and it really didn't make the... The concept. explicit error models look very good um, in a way because of the way that it was presented in the first one, even when you put the error into the dendrite and you didn't need these particular pairs of value and error neurons, there was still specificity in the connections um, that seemed not biologically plausible. But I mean, this is because they were invoking this extra inhibitory component. So yeah, yeah, well, yeah. but so the second paper doesn't talk about that, but it also doesn't lay out an actual explicit algorithm. So, mm -hmm. but in any case, I mean, yeah, I think that the, the, the dendrite approach is uh, feasible, but the current ways that it's talked about do require a yeah. little bit too much specificity. But not... And the, the temporal signal of something that the global control signal that indicates switching, I don't think is awful as a possibility. So yeah, I was, I was, I was, the table no, really possible, threw me. I think. Yeah. <laughs> no, another thing about the table is the, what was it? The, um, the comp number of layers you have to compare go through to computer or something oh like a, yeah. yeah the propagation so i guess i mean 
one one issue with that i suppose is that you could easily have a circuit which is dual purpose right and you can have i think the same circuit can do pro the feed forward propagation sort of prediction or whatever uh separately and so that wouldn't be as much of an issue i'm not sure if that made any sense what i said you're saying things could happen in parallel rather than yeah. serial and so yeah. the, the you wouldn't their claim the... that yeah the predictive coding thing takes more exactly. propagation yeah, time yeah. might not be true although um, the dendritic one did not take more propagation time according to their table oh I mean, okay right I, yeah. I, but i'm trying to, to, to just to push back yet a little sure. bit further on uh, on this point about the, the plausibility of the dendritic one yeah, I mean, in the table, the dendritic one has, whatever, two red marks suggesting biological implausibility. <laughs> um, but, uh, I mean, this is why partly when, when Jan and I were kind of riffing roughly um, the dendritic one before we got into the specific proposals made by these papers, I, I think it is clear that there are, like, many candidate mechanisms yeah. for, how, uh, for how the apical dendrites could communicate or signal to the cell some sort of error signal or some sort of plasticity indicator. I mean, it, you know, it, it could be according to, uh, I think, I mean, I think we don't yet know enough about the circuitry to know precisely how, how it works. But uh, the fact that there are many candidate mechanisms, both in terms of sort of internal state of the cell mm. or electrical signaling or, you know, sort of ion channel signaling yeah. uh, like with calcium. Yeah. Uh, the, the fact that there's so, so many possibilities suggests that it's going to take, I think, more biological evidence before we narrow this down. Like, I, like, I don't think this is... Yeah, I don't yeah, think sure. this is one where we just need to reason about it more and explore mechanisms. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I would say that the theory has done a good job of roughly characterizing the space. And I think it, it will be the responsibility of experimentalists to, uh, to probe these sort of things driven by the theory, right? Like, I mean, in this case... The, the theory is less making specific predictions than I, I think it is encouraging experimentalists to explore um, the kind of whole system uh, with an eye for which properties could be relevant. I think we don't even yet know all of the properties and there's more exploration that simply mm -hmm. needs to be done. But I think w w one thing that th the theory is in danger of doing is uh, over constraining the direction of experimental exploration. I mean, so one thing that you hear a lot is like, oh, it's, uh, you know, a global error signal is, or a specific error signal is implausible. I mean, there are, okay, I'm not, I don't want, I'm not sure I want to say dozens, but there are lots of neuromodulators and they, you know, lots of them, they, they have very different diffusive properties and they have very different temporal properties. And there's lots of cell specificity, cell, cell specificity in the, in the way that they react to neuromodulators. So I think there can be a lot done there as well that possibly experimentalists might get the message like oh i shouldn't just I, you know this is uh this isn't the right way of doing it and so i'm gonna like forget about how, how this sort of chemical computation might happen um so that's kind of something that i kind of got from this as well i have a guess that there are a lot of experimentalists who have no interest yep. in this literature or knowledge of it so we might not be too constrained yeah if we really wanted to go the machine learning route we would um base our guesses off of which algorithm performed best when they trained a network to do digit recognition right <laughs> and on mnist the predictive coding with separate error cells uh method did the best oh, really? the lowest okay. error hmm. um were they all implemented by the same person or it's in the table so i think they might have i assume been. it was sure. all by well, well that's a big assumption i don't know <laughs> yeah <laughs> that was a horrible assumption <laughs> it's all on the same table it must be comparable okay any final thoughts um i actually so kind of on the the last few no the points we were making of you know how how does this sort of fit into the interaction between experimentalists and theorists I think there's something else which is um, kind of not really discussed here, which I is my kind of pet like reason why you should look at biologically plausible learning roles, and it's um, for implementing a neuromorphic hardware. Basically, it, the, it is very early days to start coming up with very specific models of biologically plausible learning and saying the brain is doing this. But I think it's ver a very good time to say, okay, like you know, uh, deep learning is doing very well for you know, lots of computational applications, but there's constraints that um, these neuromorphic hardware systems have that aren't satisfied um, with the current algorithm. So like, how can we deal with this and sort of, you know, have local computations and this kind of thing? But I mean, uh, so my relatively naive view sure. 
uh, would be that you would probably want to design a whole new space of yeah. more of a hardware specific mm -hmm. variations on backprop. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, so like yeah. there's like what you can do on a normal computer, there's what you can do in the biology in terms of backpropagation, and then there's this whole third space of yeah. trying to design new backpropagation routines that are implementable on neuromorphic hardware. Or just, yeah. You know. So, but there's an overlap there between the the biology and then and then the sort of I mean, some, the some of the hardware. Yeah. Yeah. The point of the neuromorphic hardware is that there's an overlap with the biology. No, no I mean that's 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 a little bit the neuromorphic hardware. It's you, overemphasized. The probably. Yeah. Devi yeah, well, I mean, it deviates quite substantially from the biology in a number of ways. Yeah. When when I when I looked into this literature a few years ago for um, our episode on neuromorphic computing. Oh no no! I, I, I mean, I looked into it <laughs> well, quite substantially at, at one point. Uh, you know, uh, looking into the textbooks on it and things like. Uh, th there's a lot of liberties taken with neuromorphic hardware, and like sometimes an approach that people might say is like, "Oh, we're gonna upload a trained net to yeah, a yeah, neuromorphic yeah. So system this is and like not even bother with learning." Yeah, so that other people might say we're going to require that the hardware emulate a neural system. But we will, and we will allow the weights to be programmable. But we will uh, implement the programming of the weights using a normal computer, yep. where we periodically update or occasionally yeah, yeah. update. So I'm the, talking about like basically the the reason that that this is done now in in the sort of neuromorphic, neuromorphic hardware space is because they can't do that computation within the chip because it requires all of these. Sort yeah, of, I, but I think it's it's not just. I mean, it's not just do, that. Like yeah. they also maybe haven't been focusing so much on that either, right? Or it's it, it or it doesn't be, make sense to it, even yeah. do that. So yeah, I mean, I think there are there are lots of things going on. I mean, yeah, I think also neuromorphic hardware is is going to likely be for a while without when it doesn't rely on more conventional computers to help update it or help reprogram it. Uh, it has it has less bandwidth in the sense that like it's modeling simple neurons. Mm -hmm. Whereas, as we've been talking about, biological neurons have these multiple compartments and, you know, yeah. chemical and sort of gene regulatory processes going on mm -hmm. internally. Um, so I, I think there's a lot more difficulty. All right. That was fun. Thanks, Jan. Thanks. Till next time. Yep. Hey, if you're still listening to this, you must really like us. So how about you go to iTunes or Stitcher and rate the podcast, give us some feedback. You can also go to our website, unsupervisedthinkingpodcast.blogspot.com. You can comment on different episodes, or you could give us ideas for new topics you want to hear about. We would love to hear from you. Thanks.